Welcome to Eureka Springs, Arkansas. Considered the little Switzerland of America because of its mountainous terrain and winding streets. In fact, this is a place where no two streets intersect at a 90 degree angle and there are no traffic lights. History and modern culture mix brilliantly here to create a true hidden gem tucked away in the Ozark Mountains. So get your traveling pants on and get ready to shout Eureka! When it comes to unique, it's hard to compete with the melting pot that Eureka Springs. Settlers from as early as the Civil War were drawn to this area by legends of a great healing spring, rumored to have the ability to cure crippling diseases. In 1880, the area was incorporated as a booming city, boasting a population second only to Little Rock by 1889. Eureka Springs is so diverse and it's hard to find any place more interesting to stay than the 1880s Crescent Hotel and Spa. You see, it's considered the crown of Eureka. It epitomizes the town's Victorian architecture. June Westfall, the city's historian, talks about the early development of the Crescent City. I began researching in 1965, seriously researching um, printed, very scarce newspapers, researching every fact I could drag out of it and looking at every photograph I could find. And over the years, we've built an enormous collection in the community of, of uh, photographs of uh, every site and structure and many, many people. So we have a great photo history of the town. Some of the very first people who came here to live were men who were quite gifted as, as carpenters and builders. The builders who worked in stone used the uh, local limestone. They built mostly commercial buildings. The um, carpenters picked up their tools and they began to build in wood. They decorated the houses with uh, hand-turned, hand-sawed uh, bits of wood. That's what we call the gingerbread, all those ornamented trims that they placed on the houses. And the architecture that in Great Britain and in Europe was made from stone and that type of material. Here in America, carpenters who worked with simple hand tools were creating in wood that same type of Gothic architecture and that's what we have to a great degree in Eureka Springs. The Crescent Hotel is considered America's most haunted hotel, hosting nightly ghost tours for those who are supernaturally inclined, if you buy into that kind of stuff. Visitors and TV crews come from all over the world to test their mettle against the Crescent's ghostly inhabitants. It's known as the most haunted hotel in America. And I think that's not necessarily because the same vision gets seen, you know. But what we do get is a lot of sightings, a lot of recurrent stories uh, over the decades. We get the same story happening in the same place. People come in and tell you things that they saw that have never, don't know that it's part of the mythology that, they, that has been seen before. I think what I've seen is one of the ghosts. And I'm like the most skeptical person ever. Uh, certainly not a haunted house here. We just tell those stories. What we do is we tell the history of the building and interweave it with the legends of the ghosts. I think the history on the tour is probably the thing I like the most. Eureka Springs, as you probably have heard, grew up overnight when the Indian Healing Spring was rediscovered and found, and then from a, a population of absolute zero, it went to 15,000. Coming here looking for healing and of course bringing their ailments with them. And then a fellow called Powell Clayton 
who was the first governor of Arkansas after the war between the states. One of the things he did was to bring in the railroad and that brought in a different uh, clientele and uh, he built this hotel at the end of the railroad line to accommodate those people. So it was a very fancy hotel, 100 rooms, uh, stable for 100 horses, swimming pools and tennis courts and all what were mod cons in those days, elevators, steam heat, and it was a very, very fancy building. For the first 15 years of its existence, 20 years, uh, we have hundreds of testimonials of people who did get cured by the waters, and then they kind of uh, diminished and faded away. So to keep this building alive, they converted it into something else. It was still a hotel in the summer, but in the winter months it became a conservatory for young ladies. Then in 1937, a fellow came here who was extremely well known all over the country as a broadcaster. His name is Norman Baker. And what most of his programming was devoted to was selling what he called absolutely guaranteed cure for cancer. Well, he had never set foot in medical school in his life. He didn't have any cure for cancer. He just had a good eye for a fast buck. It's always been a hotel apart from those two breaks, one as a school and one as a hospital. But those, are, those two breaks are the times when most of our ghost stories come from, especially from the Norman Baker period when the place was filled with sick and dying people. Uh, there was a place downstairs he used for, he had his surgeons that he employed do autopsies down there. It's his morgue, and that's where our ghost tours end up. And the people who come from all across the country and other countries, the, what they come for is to go to the morgue. They would cut the organs out, the cancerous portion of the bodies, place them in the jar of formaldehyde, then ship them over to the parts room, and then they'd need a place to stack the bodies, and that was right here in the meat locker. And you are more than welcome to go into the meat locker, and we can turn out the light and close the door, and you guys could snap some photos. On more than one occasion, guests have gotten more than they bargained for. I did feel a wave of sickness a couple times. People feel something happened to them, even if it's only a feeling on the back of their neck, or they feel like they got poked or something, they're sure they left it down there and they find it over there. I was scared to go to bed last night. Like, I was, I was like looking over the blanket, making sure nobody was there. 95% of the stuff that happens can be explained by rational means, but there's maybe about 5% out there that defies explanation. And that's where it gets interesting. This is Fresh, a restaurant that is focused on seasonally prepared foods. And what's interesting about it is its owner, Ken, actually came here from a larger city, from New York, to a smaller town, and he has been able to overcome some of the challenges of actually sourcing locally produced and organically grown foods to prepare for his menu. So why don't we go inside and check it out? Today we are making one of our new items for the summer menu. It's our pasta carbonara made with uh, handmade pasta. We're going to serve it with some organic chicken from Crystal Lake Farms, which is a local Arkansas free range chicken producer. Start with a little onion on medium high heat. Next we'll go with a little bit of prosciutto. Usually let it saute for about a minute and a half to two minutes. Once the uh, onions and prosciutto start to brown and sweat nicely, we're going to go ahead and add our nice local mushrooms and a tab of butter. And at this point, we'll go ahead and add our chicken as well. I like that a little bit more fresh cracked black pepper. Works really nicely with a carbonara sauce. Once we allow that to get browned pretty well, we'll go ahead and deglaze with some white wine. By deglazing with the wine, the change in temperature allows those pieces to come off of the pan. It's a flavor that you don't want to miss out on. Add our heavy cream, some nice sweet peas. And we're just going to let this reduce for a minute until it reaches a paste consistency, which is where it'll coat a spoon. Um, we don't want to over reduce it because by adding the egg yolk really helps to thicken the sauce. I'm looking for the entire surface to be covered by little bubbles in between all the little uh, ingredients that are floating in around there. That'll mean the sauce is about to reach its thickness point. And I already have my water boiling nicely. I'm going to go ahead and hit that with a couple teaspoons of salt, splash of olive oil. Remove the chicken off to the side and let it rest. Redistribute all of its nice juices. 
and the sauce looks about ready. So I'm gonna take that off the heat for a minute while I add my fresh pasta to the water. For fresh pasta, it's 45 seconds for this recipe because we're gonna undercook the pasta a little bit and then finish it in the sauce. Take the sauce back to the heat just to get it back to its nice little bubble point. Go ahead and strain that off nicely. Usually when I add a fresh pasta to a sauce, I'll add a little bit of olive oil. We'll take it off the heat, hit it with a little bit of our fresh shredded Parmesan, and then this is the most integral part of a carbonara, is adding the egg yolk in without overcooking it or letting it scramble. So I'll begin to stir this and then very quickly stir that in. And sometimes you might have to add just a little dash of heavy cream to loosen it up if it gets too thick on you. Get all those little goody bits in there. And then we're ready to plate. Ken, this is so good. Oh. Thank you, I'm so glad you're here. Tell me about these mushrooms. Those mushrooms come from uh, Adams Acres Farms. They're located in Fayetteville, Arkansas. Mm. And it's just recent that we're able to get them from one of our food purveyors. That's the distribution part of the equation, isn't it? You bet. You can't run all over the <laughs> three counties gathering up what you're gonna serve at night. The concept was fresh, so no processed foods if possible, yeah. that sort of thing. And then we added the farm to table component. And in pretty short order, I realized that I was doing a lot of traveling to get the products that we needed. So for example, we have a fish and chip item on our menu that uh, has a huge following and mm -hmm. there's really nothing local or organic about it. No, but they, the potatoes, it tastes, uh, good. It, it tastes good. And so then when we get into dishes like these, where 100% um, with the, maybe the exception of your peas, or, or local and organic, including us making our own pasta. Sure. Um, it, it, there's variations on our ability to source different menu items. As we've grown, I will say that we're more consistently able to source local items on a continuum. Yeah, well, it's just it's just outstanding. Thank you. I don't like art. Whenever I travel, I always like to check out the local scene. And here in Eureka Springs, they have a series of storefronts, almost like a little village where each artist has their own studio slash display. It's really a lot of fun to check out. Come on, let's take a look. Well, we are the coolest place in town, the art colony, and uh, we're full of all eclectic artists. My name is Adam Blue and I do custom stained glass and I mainly can take any photo and turn it into a stained glass window. The art colony is an amazing place to be creative. I've been painting since I was about five years old and I paint because I have to. I think that it's, um, it's that power that's greater than me that restores me to sanity. If I'm not painting on a regular basis, I can get uh, weird. Everyone does anything from uh, woodworking to uh, scrimshaw to uh, just fine arts. It's just a collective of souls. They, they get together and, and be creative. And, and creative isn't just uh, making its being. I think what makes it the most unique is uh, the freedom that we all have and we don't have a lot of rules. The main rule is that you just have to be nice or leave. On days where I don't feel necessarily inspired, I, and I'm here surrounded by beautiful people, you know, somebody maybe already painting, so, and there's just, it raises the whole vibe. So being around creative people kind of like makes me feel more creative. Um, plus we have like collaboration sometimes, you know, like for example, I just brought in this busted frame that I scored from a, from a job site. And we have a woodworker here who will likely help me put it together. We're here to give free tours when people come by and uh, they start usually on Wednesday and finish up on Sunday. If you want to buy something from the artist, that's uh, great also. I hope people should come to the Art Colony just for art fun. It's just a unique adventure in art. It'll inspire you, and especially if you're an artist for sure, uh, it'll give you ideas and people just fall in love with the place and they come back year after year. The people that are here, we, I consider them very lucky. I'm very lucky to be here. It's a really cool place. To me, it's, a, it's about communication. 
and it's, an, it's a nonverbal communication, whether if I'm doing something abstract and I'm not giving somebody a form to base some ideas off of, then, and I'm, you know, it's just color or movement, just making more lovely out of the world. Preserving the natural landscape is important to the locals of Eureka. In the last several years, the city has undergone a lot of construction in pursuit of keeping the area green and beautiful. One of the current projects is the restoration of Lake Leatherwood Park. The commission was actually formed in 1980 and it is charged with maintaining and protecting about 1,800 acres of public land that the city owns. Lake Leatherwood City Park is uh, a multi-use park. There's an 85-acre lake where uh, all kinds of boating activity, fishing, that kind of thing. And we have about uh, uh, 25 miles of trails, multi-use trails, biking and hiking and uh, a variety of other kind of outdoor recreational opportunities there as well that the uh, locals enjoy as well as our visitors. We have a master plan at Lake Leatherwood City Park that we're currently executing, which uh, the intent is to make it self-sustaining. Uh, as it is, we're subsidizing the park and have for a number of years. We're trying to put it on its own two feet, trying to enhance the recreational opportunities there. Another exciting thing that we've got going on at parks is a, uh, a master plan for trails that the city formally adopted last July. And the intent there is to essentially double the amount of trails we have in town, uh, which is about 30 currently, but even more importantly, tile those trails together, connect them, make it a trail system, where you literally can jump on a trail anywhere uh, inside the city limits of Eureka and stay on a trail and move uh, around within the system. In a town that struggles with parking, uh, and with narrow streets, uh, it will also serve as a, a, a transportation system. I foresee in the near future where there'll be enough trail in place where by foot or by bike, you can pretty much go wherever you want to go and safely. Since this show is focused on the unique, you'd be hard pressed to find any place as interesting as Turpentine Creek Wildlife Refuge. Hey there, big guy. Kitty, 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 kitty. Started in 1992, Turpentine Creek provides a home for abandoned, abused, and neglected big cats. And when I say big, I mean big cats. With an emphasis on, yes, tigers, lions, leopards, and cougars. And this 450 acre ranch is the home to over 130 of these large felines, as well as other endangered wildlife like some big bears. Emily, this is one big kitty cat. It is. <laughs> this is Mac, a male tiger. This is very much a wild animal. He is a tiger, fully clawed. His canines are there, so <laughs> this is a dangerous animal. Currently, we have 102 cats, and we also have six black bear. 102. Uh -huh. <laughs> six black bear and a grizzly bear, and most of the cats are, are tigers, but we have Smash. lions and cougars and uh, some bobcats and leopards. I'd love to see some black bears. All right, let's go check them out. That'd be wonderful. This is Thunder, and the other is Harley. And these are two rescued bears that we actually introduced here. Right. Uh, Thunder was quite young. So these are North American natives. And yep, they're native and um, they're still not a pet. They're yeah, still a no, wild animal. A you know, well, so I notice not. you have things in, in here for them to play with. And like the Christmas tree, is that, what's the tree for? Uh, all of the toys in any of the trees, branches, anything like that, we use for enrichment um, with all of the animals, even the cats. 
Uh, we have an enrichment garden that we started a couple of years ago with uh, some volunteers and grow different herbs, um, oh, really? different things to use for scent enrichment. I see. And different animals react differently to those. So sure. anything so from catnip to rosemary. Um, rosemary. Oh, yeah, mm -hmm. really? So uh, <laughs> mint, we have a lot of mint. It gives them something to do, something yeah. that, you know, different for them to right, smell. Right. And, um, it stimulates and right. them in a different way, exactly. in a positive way. Yeah. <laughs> So Emily, tell me about the need for, for sanctuaries for animals like this. Just tigers, they estimate there's between five to 7,000 in the US and there's only 3,200 left in the wild. So only 7% of, of those animals are in zoos and sanctuaries. So let's talk about the difference between a sanctuary and a zoo, because I know a lot of zoos are dedicated to the preservation and conservation of huh. certain animal species. Sanctuaries are, are necessary because these animals that are here and rescued out of sanctuaries aren't genetically pure. Mm. Um, zoos do a lot of uh, conservation work and breeding for species survival plans. And these, these animals are the generic, the American tiger. You know, they're Bengal-Siberian mixes, mm, they're Sumatran mixes. Mm. Well, I'm sure that a lot of these animals come from situations that are questionable. You really don't know what sort of how they were treated, right. you know, like abused children. Exactly. One of the best things that this sanctuary does is get those animals to gain trust in people again. Mm -hmm. We don't ever trust them. They're a wild animal. Right. This is a good distance. So to bring them out of their but, shells, as it were. Right, and know yeah. that they're going to be well cared for. They're going to get fed and watered and vitamins and medicine when they need it and live out their life peacefully. Well, that's all the time we have for today's show. I hope you've enjoyed it as much as I have. We've seen that Eureka Springs is full of history, the great outdoors, local flavors. Until next time, I'm Alan Smith. The Crescent Hotel is known as America's most haunted hotel. They have nightly ghost tours here. Of course, if you believe in that mumbo jumbo. Well, that's all the time we have for today's show. You could. Uh, <laughs>